Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> My name is LaFawn Bailey. I'm with the Global Diversity and Inclusion Team. I'm also a member of the Black Googlers Network. So on behalf of the network and authors at, I'd like to welcome you here today. I have the absolute pleasure of introducing Dr. Clarence B. Jones. His remarks today are titled Reflections on the Legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and Black History Month. Dr. Jones is a, I'm just gonna give you a few highlights because I don't want to ruin the conversation. Um, but he's a scholar writer in residence and visiting professor at the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute at Stanford University in Palo Alto. He served as speechwriter and counsel to Martin Luther King Jr. and was co-writer of the I Have a Dream speech. He's also provided strategic legal and financial consulting services to several governments around the world, including the Bahamas, the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, and Zambia. He has received numerous state and national awards recognizing his significant contributions to American society. He's kind of a superstar. He has also been the subject of numerous television and radio interview programs, such as CNN, The O'Reilly Factor, NPR, and BBC. He completed teaching for the second time of his successful course, From Slavery to Obama, at Stanford University's School of Continuing Studies Master of Liberal Arts program. He wrote Behind the Dream, the making of the speech that transformed a nation. He is currently co-writing a book, Where Were You, for the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. And he's also a regular columnist on the Huffington Post. Lastly, he is writing his autobiography, Memoirs of a Wintertime Soldier. So without further ado, Dr. Clarence B. Jones. Thank you very much. This is my second time here at Google. The first time I came to be with uh, my goddaughter, Soledad O'Brien. And so when, she, uh, when you had this special program, and so I had a chance to uh, see the campus and so forth, as I said. Anyway, I'm delighted to be here. I am honored that you have provided me with this opportunity to share with you my views on the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and Black History Month. Um, very succinctly, in 12 years and four months, 1956 and 1968, aside from President Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation, Occupation, Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, Martin Luther King Jr. may have done more to achieve social, racial, political, and economic justice in America than any, any other single event or person in the previous 400 years of history of our country. My oldest daughter is a graduate of Brown University. I have five children. Uh, Brown University, Georgetown University Law School, and the Wharton School of Finance. Perhaps like some of you today, at one time she believed her subsequent career opportunities and success were solely because of her individual dedication and achievement. With her newly minted prestigious academic degrees, she just knew she was bad. <laughs> Help me somebody. <laughs> Prior to Martin Luther King Jr., America was like a dysfunctional drug or alcoholic addict. We had become addicted to racial segregation. We had tried to kick our habit of dependency and addiction to racism and institutional segregation. With his tough love of nonviolent civil disobedience, Dr. King forced America's conscience to publicly confront the contradiction between the reality of how it treated 12% of its population, African Americans, and those precepts enshrined in our Declaration of Independence. Dr. King's tough love enabled America to embark on an extraordinary peaceful journey to recover its soul. He raised the consciousness of America on the issue of race and gender equality in America, making it possible for my oldest daughter and many of you, white, black, and Asian, to enjoy the opportunity and positions you now have at Google. America has been a country of slavery longer than, longer than it has been a free country. The ideological foundation of slavery was that the ancestors of African Americans were of a different species of human beings, inferior in intellect and culture to that of their slave masters. Slave owners had no interest in the language, culture, or history of their slaves. It was a criminal felony in slaveholding states to teach a slave to read or write. Therefore, slaves were deemed to have no history worthy of transmitting from generation to generation. The average white person and African-American 
was for, de was for decades educated in school systems where most textbooks omitted or relegated to inconsequential textual coverage the history and contributions of generations of African Americans to our society. James W. Lowen's book, Lies My Teacher Told Me, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong, should be read by everyone who has any doubt about the accuracy of my assertion. Why no Irish, Italian, Jewish, or Scandinavian History Month? Irish, Italian, Jewish, or Scandinavian forefathers and foremothers were not forcibly uprooted from their native homelands and brought to America in chains and endured a middle passage aboard slave ships that killed an estimated 25 million plus during transport to our shores. They and the forefathers of other ethnic groups in our country were not enslaved by our national government or sanctioned by, by our national government. To fully appreciate the magnitude of Dr. King's contribution to our country, we have to revisit an important crossroad in the development of race relations in America. In 1857, the United States posed this question, quote, can a Negro whose ancestors were imported into this country and sold as slaves become a member of the political community formed and brought into the existence by the Constitution of the United States? and as such become entitled to all rights and privileges and immunities guaranteed by that instrument to the citizens, one of which rights is the privilege of suing in a court of the United States. The Supreme Court of the United States in the decision of Dred Scott versus Sanford ruled that blacks, both free and enslaved, were guaranteed no rights, civil, social, or political, by the United States Constitution. Chief Justice Taney stated that blacks were not citizens because at the time of the Constitution was drafted, they were, quote, considered as a subordinate and inferior class of beings and had no rights or privileges but such as the government might choose to grant them. The court did not say that the Irish, Italian, Jewish, Scandinavian, or the forefathers of other ethnic groups were guaranteed no rights, civil, social, or political, by the United States Constitution. Justice Taney, Taney continued and said, when the founding fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence, the legitimacy of slavery, quote, was fixed and universal in the civilized portion of the white race. It was regarded as an axiom in morals as well as in politics. Now, the Supreme, this Supreme Court ruling was superseded and overruled by the passage of the 13th and 14th Amendments in 1865 and 1868, respectively. This was the legal foundation underlying Martin Luther King Jr.'s moral leadership to transform America. That is section one of the 14th Amendment, which provides that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside, and that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Against the background of systematic exclusion of the history, of the language and culture, and other contributions of African Americans to the development of our country, a month devoted to reflecting on black history is not inappropriate. A focus on our history will also reveal the significant contributions of white people, especially Jewish people, to the struggle for our civil rights. Jews played a leading role in the formation of the National Association for the advancement of colored people. Two Jewish brothers, jo Joel Elias Spingarn and Arthur Spingarn, served at varying times as the organization's president. November 28th, I was watching the presidential election, uh, presidential election returns in Palo Alto at the home of a colleague of mine, Dr. Claiborne Carson, who was the director of the King Institute here at Stanford. There were several people assembled when the TV networks announced 
that T Senator Barack Obama had accumulated sufficient electoral votes to be declared, to de to be declared president-elect, several persons in the room began to shed tears. I was asked if I ever thought I would live long enough to see an African-American elected president of the United States. I said no. However, I also said my tears were not because of Senator, Barama's, Senator Obama's election. My tears were for all those persons whom I personally knew who were no longer living but who had made possible the election of Barack Obama. Black history has been written from the struggle of black people to be free. It includes not only the role and contributions of people like Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, W. E. Du Bois, Rosa Parks, Jimmy Lee Jackson, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, Hosea Williams, Martin and Coretta Scott King, et al., but also several white people, such as Viola Liuzzo, Reverend James Reed, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, Jonathan Daniels, Rabbi Howard and Marsha Saperstein, and two young men from Manhattan, New York, Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner, who in the summer of 1964 went to Mississippi to assist African Americans to vote. They were brutally murdered by the Ku Klux Klan in Philadelphia, Mississippi. John Johnson, the founder and publisher of Ebony and Jet magazine, and Martin Luther King Jr. may have done more to enable a whole generation of African Americans to look from whence they came their contributions to our country and who they really are than perhaps any two single individuals in the 20th century. Bombarded 24 seven in print and in television with the white Hollywood standard of beauty and success, Ebony Magazine sought to celebrate the achievement of blacks in America and the black experience in general. Martin Luther King Jr. gave black people a sense of purpose that they were somebody Yes, that indeed black was beautiful and that a racist cannot ride on your back if you are not bent over, but walking upright and tall. Black history has been written from the struggles of black people to be free. Today, we witness the peculiar historical attributes of the black experience becoming the fuel that drives the engine of much of the popular culture in America in dance, language, fashion, sports, and music. In 2008, as I said, Americans elected an African American as its 44th president of the United States. Maybe the power of the absorption and the adoption of the historical experience of black Americans into the mainstream majority in America means that someday Black History Month will no longer be necessary, potentially becoming an anachronism and a historic dinosaur. Thank you so much. I'll take questions. Um, one of the first uh, questions that were posted is, in your book, you have a chapter where you write about James Earl Ray. And as you would say, it's truth-telling time. In your opinion, what would Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. say about his assassination? In my opinion, one of the things he might say is that uh, uh, he would uh, forgive James R. Ray, but he would not forgive the United States government and media that would want to perpetuate the fairy tale that James Earl Ray was the sole single person involved in the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Now let me be very clear. James Earl Ray pulled the trigger of the rifle that killed Martin Luther King Jr. But let me also be very clear. The assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. did not result from James Earl Ray getting up one morning on April 4th, 1968, 
and say, today is the day I'm going to kill that king nigger. That is not what happened. Martin Luther King Jr. was killed with the James Earl Ray pulling the trigger by the cold, premeditated, calculated, conspiratorial uh, uh, determination of murder. He was killed as a result of cold, calculated, conspiratorial agreement of murder. We don't know who the other people are yet. But as they say, at least in the older generations, uh, there used to be a uh, saying that the truth full out. It probably won't come out in my limited lifetime, but it will come out. It will come out someday as to who the other peoples were, other people were who participated in it. A fourth grade, educated, uh, fourth grade educated person, a convict, had intimate knowledge of Canada, had intimate knowledge of the geography of London, had all these plans. Please, give me a break. Thank yeah. you. Do you want to ask a question? Hi. Thank, thanks for visiting us and sharing with us. I, it's an honor to speak with you. <clears throat> I'm curious about your opinion about what is the, what is the greatest obstacle to that day you speak of um, when we don't even need black history any month because it's you know, racism is forgotten. What are the, what's the greatest obstacle to achieving colorblind equality and what can we do to confront it? Okay. First, let me, let me uh, respond and define, because I, you, you use a, a phrase which is uh, frequently used and I've used it myself, but I want us to be speaking in the same language and the same baseline. The concept of colorblind equality may mean different things to different people. But in the Martin Luther King Jr. sense, colorblind equality means not that a person is blind to color, but that the color is irrelevant in the judgment you make on a person. Anybody who tells me that I'm colorblind, I would say, well, you need to go see an ophthalmologist <laughs> because you have a serious problem. Okay? Colorblind, in terms of uh, prejudice and racism, really means we arrive at a point where the judgment or determination as to what opportunities will be made available across the whole spectrum of circumstances, education, housing, and employment, is that the color of the person who's seeking those opportunities is totally irrelevant. The only thing that's relevant is their qualifications. Um, I'll read a question from our moderator page. If you were to rewrite the speech for today's audience, what would you change, if anything? Well, it's interesting that you should say that <laughs> because uh, one of the things I'm uh, contemplating is that 2013 is going to be the uh, 50th anniversary of the March on Washington and the I Have a Dream speech. And I am uh, contemplating um, drafting a uh, 2013 version of what that speech might say. Um, but in direct response to your question, um, it's, it's, it's hard for me to give a, 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 a weighted sequence of importance. I can think of one thing, for example, the, over the years, whether as a result of a failed drug policy or whether as a result of the unequal uh, racist application of uh, uh, laws, is that uh, young black men who have run afoul of the law for a whole combination of reasons, many of them being drugs, constitute an overwhelming segment of our incarcerated population in prisons. It is a, is a, is a national disgrace. Uh, someone who has studied this extensively is Professor Michelle Alexander. She has a book out on this, which I recommend, whose title I can't think of right now, but she deals with, I think it's on the, the rise of the, I think it's Jim Crow and the rise of the incarcerated state, but I may be wrong. So that's the one thing I would think. And, um, uh, you know, Dr. King was a minister of the gospel before he was a civil rights leader. And 
the intersection of both of those things and his study and commitment to the philosophy of Gandhi made him deeply spiritually, intellectually, and totally committed to nonviolence. So he would be appalled by the, uh, the escalation of violence. Um, I might call, I might remind you that on April 4th, 1967, one year to the date of his assassination, he gave a speech at Riverside uh, Chapel in New York before a committee called Concerned Laymen and Clergy. It was time to break the silence. It was his first public um, uh, um, declaration of opposition to the Vietnam War. And in that speech, um, there was one sentence that is so powerful as you get down in like the first three minutes of the speech as you read it, he has a sentence that says, at that time, April 4th, 1967, calling for an end to the Vietnam War, he says, the United States today is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, period. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Jones, thank you yes, for sir. coming today. Um, my question is this, and as you mentioned, um, unfortunately, many of the leaders that you marched alongside and worked alongside are no longer with us today. And obviously, as time goes on, um, we're looking for that next generation of leadership um, to kind of be that moral compass, if you will. So I wanted to know, in your opinion, if there's anybody that you see now kind of as that up-and-coming rising star, and if so, or even if not, what advice would you give them? Well, there are lots of up-and-coming rising stars of new generation of leaders. But here, I'm going to have to give you uh, an answer that I've given ad nauseum. And so maybe some of you have read it or heard it because I've given it on NPR. And so I have to just say it again. When people ask me who today, if anyone, do I think is most like Martin Luther King Jr., I use a Latin phrase called sui generis, which means one of a kind, unique. And I answer their question with a rhetorical question. Who today, if anyone, is like Galileo, like Mozart, like uh, Beethoven, uh, Shakespeare, Copernicus, Michelangelo? No one. If you were fortunate enough to be alive, from 1956 until April 4th, 1968. And metaphorically, you walked outside at midnight and looked up at the sky and saw a shooting star across the heavens. And you saw a shooting star of such incandescent brightness that a brightness that had never been seen before by any astronomer or by you. That shooting star was Martin Luther King Jr. We will never, ever, 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 ever see that shooting star again in our lifetime or in the millennium. Okay. Did you have another question? So, like possibly many people here when I was in college, I did um, some research in a paper on Martin Luther King. And one of the things that I noted uh, is that it was Vietnam, when he started talking about Vietnam, that seemed to cause more problems for him than anything else. And also the Kennedys were starting to object to Vietnam. And so when you, are, when you were saying, like the conspiracy that James Earl Ray and obviously the others weren't the ones that organized pulling the trigger, do you think that Vietnam actually influenced his death? along with the Kennedys? I think that uh, his uh, opposition, his public opposition to the war in Vietnam, I think um, probably more on a continuing basis, his beginning, his uh, raising the issue of uh, poverty and income inequality in America. Um, it is important, some of you, by looking at your apparent age demographic, may not know that when he, when he spoke in uh, April 4th, 1967, at the time of his assassination, while there, have been, uh, there was a great national outcry of grief, and while subsequent to them there have been national monuments, the fact of the matter is 
is that he had become a pariah, is that uh, even people, uh, many uh, uh, leaders of civil rights organizations began to publicly turn on him. And so-called uh, um, um, liberal friends, and, and this includes people in the churches, it includes people in among um, civil rights organizations, and certainly people in Congress, they in effect felt that he didn't have the right. That who was he just a preacher? How, could, how dare he speak out and, and, and challenge the policy, the government of the United States? The fact of the matter is, is that he, was, uh, he had become persona non grata. Now with respect to the uh, Kennedys, um, I don't have enough time to say and give the right nuanced response to the question, but I will simply recite a historical fact. And you conclude from that historical fact whatever you wish to conclude. From July 13th, 1963 to December 1967, on the authorization of the Attorney General of the United States, Robert Kennedy, and J. Edgar Hoover, every single telephone call that occurred between Martin Luther King Jr. and myself, from my home to his home, from my home to his office, from his home to my office, 24-7, was wiretapped and a written transcription of the conversation written down so that you, so let me, let, let me make it plain. When I was writing uh, the first book, the publisher, or maybe it was the first or second book, I can't remember, but one of the publishers said to me, you know, uh, Mr. Jones, we, we don't doubt what you say, plus you've signed an agreement of warranty, warranting us against any suit for anything. He said, but some of the things you say are just based on what you say. And, and you appear to have a pretty good recollection. So I said, well, that's, that's not completely true. So whenever this instance would come up challenging my memory or credibility, I would simply bring in a photostatic copy of the FBI transcript. So somebody would say, well, you said, he's, you said uh, he gave this speech in August in San Francisco from the Mark Hopkins Hotel about this. And I said, yes, he did. So I just bring in the transcript. The transcript reads, uh, August so-and-so, uh, um, 10.30 in the morning, um, uh, Clarence Jones and Martin Luther King Jr. King, it just, just write, write down everything. So what's the significance of that? It's tied into also the first question, one of the first questions of James L. Ray. So when James L. Ray, so when Martin King was assassinated, I'm saying to myself, my first reaction is I want to get over the grief and horror of it all. I said, no. They knew everything I was doing and he was doing 24-7. When I went to the bathroom, and by the way, it included photographic surveillance, not just, I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? There were cameras, people with cameras, telescoping, taking photographs everywhere we went when we met. So I'm saying if they can do that to Martin Luther King and myself, you mean to tell me they knew nothing about James L. Ray? I rest my case. Okay. Thank you. I'll, add, I'll, I'll ask one more direct question here. It says, at first you were hesitant to leave domestic tranquility <laughs> oh, I know, I know, yeah. to help a total stranger, Dr. King. Could you talk about the important role that your wife played in encouraging you to get involved? Well, I have to make this a, a long answer short, but in 1960, um, in 1960, Dr. King was indicted by the state of Alabama for uh, lying on his uh, tax, for federal tax evasion. And I had just, um, just gotten out of law school after being in the uh, military service after, during the Korean War. After the Korean War, not in combat, but anyway, I'd just been out of law school six or seven months. And his chief defense counsel got in touch with me in California and said, we need a law clerk to go and help us prepare the defense of Dr. King. But the only problem is you have to go travel to Montgomery, Alabama, because that's where the defense of the case has been. So I, I said, no, I can't do that, Judge. His name is Judge Delaney. Fast forward, 
is that uh, during the course of this, uh, he arranged for Dr. King to come to my home. Um, uh, not, not specifically to see me, but Dr. King had a speaking engagement in Los Angeles for something else, and since his chief defense counsel said, well, since you're gonna be in Los Angeles, why don't you stop by and see this lawyer and tell him what you're trying to do. So Dr. King comes into my house, he sits down and he, you know, my wife was now deceased and mother of my adult children, and, and, he, and he says, you know, Mr. Jones, we have lots of white lawyers who help us, but we need, we need Negro, young Negro lawyers like you to help us. And I said, well, Dr. King, I'd love to help you, but I can't, blah, blah. Anyway, I decided I, I, I just couldn't do it. So when he leaves, I say, I'm fast forwarding this. This is described in greater detail in one of the books. But when he leaves, my deceased wife turns to me and she says, what do you think you're doing that is so important that you can't help this man that came all this distance to see you. And I said, excuse me, her name was Ann. I said, Ann, that's not quite true. He did not come all this distance to see me and ask my help. He had a speaking engagement. <laughs> and Judge Delaney suggested he stop by and see me. And besides, just because some Negro preacher got his can caught in a cookie jar stealing, that's not my problem. <laughs> and anyway, if he wasn't guilty, he would have been indicted. She says, I don't believe you. I said, well, that's how I feel. That was a cold night in the Jones household. That day. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, I, had to, I went to church to see him uh, be a guest preacher. Uh, preachers, uh, I mean, a guest sermon. Uh, this was on a Friday night he came. Thursday night he came. Um, I'm sorry, Friday night he came. And then on um, Sunday, I went to church where he was the guest preacher, and that, that listening to him was substantially changed my life. But the answer to your direct question, uh, Ann Norton Jones had a profound effect um, because she, uh, she had a higher level of consciousness about the importance of helping Dr. King than I did. I was narrowly focused and only wanted to get on with a career in intellectual property law. Thank goodness for her. Right. right. <laughs> Next question. Hi. Um, you alluded to this a little bit as you were speaking, but can you talk a little bit more about how Dr. King's uh, religious convictions influenced all that he stood for? How his religious convictions? Mm -hmm. His religious convictions defined to the core who he was. He was a fourth generation Baptist preacher. He was encyclopedic, the knowledge of the Bible and of uh, the Talmud. He, uh, um, the doctor in his name is for the PhD he had uh, for, for a uh, PhD in theology from the Boston School of Theology. Um, he used to remind uh, those of us who were close to him, that he was a minister of the gospel before he was a civil rights leader. Um, an example of how it influenced him was when we used to be concerned about his safety. And he would say, in effect, there is no man, there's nothing on earth that can be done to protect him is that he lives in the 24-hour protection of the arms of his Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing to protect it. Uh, we were always concerned, very much concerned about his safety. President John F. Kennedy was assassinated on Friday, November 22nd, 1963. On the evening of Friday, November 22nd, 1963, Dr. King and I finally spoke because spoke, he'd been trying to reach me. And he said, I'm being besieged by newspaper reporters. I've got to issue some statement in connection with the Kennedy assassination. He asked if I could come to Atlanta. And I said, no, I couldn't. So he flew up and we met, flew up to New York and we met at LaGuardia Airport in the Eastern Airlines uh, lounge terminal. And for three and a half hours, 
we set and crafted the, the statement that he would uh, issue on the assassination of the Kennedy, President Kennedy. But the very first thing he said as he was coming to the lounge, coming down, deplaning, and coming to the lounge and he saw my attention. When he got to me, he didn't say, hi, Clarence, how are you, so forth. The very first thing he said, he said, you see, if they can get to the president, they can get to me. So let's stop worrying about all this nonsense of protecting me. Thank you. Hi. Um, and towards the end of your book, you talk about the progress that has been made since the civil rights movement. And you talk about redressing some of the inequalities that were the legacies of slavery and discrimination. So, and I know this is a big question in your opinion, where are we on race in America today? We have, uh, <clears throat> America has come a long distance, a great distance on the question, to use your words, on race in America today. Um, the election of Barack Obama is just some evidence of that. And that um, the changing demographics in the population, both from age and ethnicity, is generally creating a much more favorable climate for African Americans and other minorities. But in direct response to your question, unfortunately, we have not reached Nirvana or we have not reached uh, Shangri-La. Um, race still matters. We wish it didn't matter. In response to an earlier question, I said about the concept of being colorblind, I really would like for us to be today, February 15th, 2012, in Mountain View, in Google headquarters, I'd like for us to be in a country where we could say without fear of contradiction that racism against African Americans and other minorities does not exist. But that simply is not the case. One of the things I think that moral leadership requires it requires the ability to see things as they really are and not how we would like them to be. Daniel Patrick Moynihan is quoted as saying, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own set of facts. There is, leaning, going back on my legal training and profession, a devastating bill of particulars can be compiled about America on February 15, 2012, that can be submitted in evidence for the court or the jury determining the question of whether racism exists. Now, there is another question that hasn't been asked, but I'm sure, and that is, who is responsible for this? I don't, I don't, I mean, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be, uh, you'd think I was stupid if I came up to you and say, well, there hasn't been any progress, you know? There's been major, major, historic progress. I can't tell you, I can't prescribe to you the timeline when someone sitting in this chair or someone we can wake up in America and we can say, today, we are America without, without institutions, without any source of power being directed against a person or a group of persons because of the color of their skin or their gender. I am hopeful. I am hopeful because just as America came through this whole transition of struggling with race, we're now struggling with the whole question of gender equality. 
And, and when you listen and read some, uh, when you listen to some people and read certain uh, articles, you would think that the republic is going to disintegrate and come apart, you know? I mean, I didn't know until recently that the fact that a, a woman can love a woman or a man can love a man and want to marry, that that was going to destroy the republic. I didn't realize that that had such consequential effects. Uh, I, 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 I was raised as a, uh, a Catholic, and I'm a spiritual religious person. And so I have a practical answer to all of this anti-gay. I said, no, there's some, some contradiction. I just came back from Israel. And I visited Jerusalem and the holy place, and I said, you know, there's some contradiction on this whole question of gay rights. If, if gay relationships were so bad and gay people were so bad, per se, why does God keep making so many of them? <laughs> Very good point. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to read another question. Dr. King survived the Civil Rights Movement but was killed a month before the Poor People's March on Washington. If he were alive today, how would he try to change the heart of the country on the issue of economic justice? He would, he would say that that is the central core question confronting America today. Um, income, inequality, um, economic injustice, as you say. I think that uh, he would totally identify, except for uh, activity of violence and except for expressions of anti-Semitism, he uh, limited expressions of violence, uh, limited activity of violence, and limited expressions of anti-Semitism expressed by the Occupy Wall Street. He would, he would identify that. He would get it. He would see. I mean, you know, as I say, you don't have to be, you have to be deaf, dumb, and blind not to, even if you, if, even if you don't, even if you can't read a lot, even if, even if you don't have a lot of education in political science and history and so forth, but if you just look around, there's something wrong. People, there's something wrong. My favorite, my favorite statement I say, which sums up my feelings. Notwithstanding all of our debt and the uh, public debt, notwithstanding all of our, we're still an extraordinary rich country. So I can't compute when I go back east. I see it more than I see here, but I see it here in parts of San Francisco. I can't, comp I can't compute in my mind how this rich country can permit a child to wake up hungry, can permit people sleeping on the streets. It's not as if we don't have the resources. There is something wrong. So the answer to your question, the, the, the demonstrated statistical data supported information of the spread the disparity in the wealth and the disparity in income would be something that would be front and center of his attention today. And he would probably say that you, well, yes, he would probably say, I'm going out on a limb. Um, I knew the gentleman fairly well. He would probably say the dream that I had in 1963, and the dream which I hope can be realized in 2013, will never ever be fulfilled until we deal with the question of income inequality, poverty, and wealth disparity. Never, will never be done. That's the challenge. Thank you. All right, we're skipping down the question. Um, this actually has to do with your, your, your previous answer about the LGBT community. Um, and it says, numerous parallels exist between the 1960s civil rights movement and the 
present movement for LGBT rights slash marriage equality. What do you believe we in the latter struggle we in the latter struggle can learn from the former. How best can we build movements that are inclusive of all? Um, the first, the first thing uh, to do, however, um, is you don't you want to you want to avoid making a uh, profound political mistake. You have to see the qualitative difference between the struggle that was undertaken by African Americans against the institution of segregation and racism in the United States and the struggle that the LBGT, the lesbian, gay, gender, transgender community is struggling. There are significant differences, but the fact that there are significant differences does not mean that those of us who support the struggle for gay rights, can't look and learn from some of the history of the struggle for civil rights. They are very different, but being very different, they also have something very much in common, and that is the elementary, it's so simple and elementary and profound, and that is a person should not be deprived of a millionth of an inch, a scintilla of his or her rights in the society because of their gender preference. That is totally unacceptable. And as I said to you earlier, I believe that is very contrary to the deepest religious principles and what confounds me is I listen to so-called leaders of the evangelical and Christian church, and they have a whole theorem, a whole mindset that rationalizes why gays should not be loved, why gays should be treated as second-class citizens. That is that is a corruption and a prostitution of the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ that I understand. It's total corruption. Um, those of us from the Civil Rights Movement, and by the way, uh, I, was, I was so singularly disappointed and actually blown away when I learned that a number of African American ministers and churches oppose gay rights in California. So I'm saying to myself, well, where have these brothers been? <laughs> I mean, they, they, I mean, you know, sometimes, sometimes an otherwise sane person can have moments of insanity. So that's the only way I can explain it. How can some African American minister in a church publicly go out and say he or is opposed to the rights of gay. It doesn't make sense. Right. When you wrote your controversial piece in the Huffington Post, Time to Think the Unthinkable, you stated progressives might have to consider running a campaign against President Obama in 2012. What was your reasoning behind this statement? My reasoning behind the statement was that I had at that time had seen President Obama make a what a, a number of cumulative compromises, a number of compromises that I thought were inconsistent with the level of leadership that I believed he should exercise. And so I began to think that, uh, you know, the other side of leadership with respect to the people you want to lead, there's an element called accountability. You can't be a leader without being accountable for your actions. And I don't remember the particular, I think it may have been the, I think it may have been the compromise on the Bush uh, tax cuts or one of the things, but I found it to be, uh, 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 I, I found him to, he, he compromised in direct contradiction to what he had campaigned on one or two issues. And I said, okay, that's it. I said, I love the brother. I said, but there's something called political accountability. 
And the only way we can make him accountable is to think the unthinkable, is to raise the question that if he, at that time, is not going to live up to the promises and the hopes that he engendered in so many people, then we have to think of another candidate who will do so. I subsequently, in a subsequent article, I then said, based upon, I don't know whether he read my article or not, but um, 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 uh, I, I, I then softened it up. And I should say, I was very pleased. Uh, um, January 16th, I was in Washington, D.C., and I was a recipient of what is Georgetown University Legacy of the Dream Award, named after John Thompson, at the Kennedy Center. And the entire Kennedy Center was, there was standing room only. And the, and the president and the first lady came. And uh, before the official proceedings at the Kennedy Center, uh, the president and first lady, president and first lady came to see me in a private room in reception. And he came over to me and he said, uh, Mr. Jones, I want to thank you so much for uh, everything you've uh, done for our country. And the first lady said something about, I can't exactly quote it, but some, some reference to the Huffington Post. So I guess they read it. <laughs> there has been tremendous social and cultural change since the climax of the civil rights movement. What themes and challenges from then are, you still, are still present today? More importantly, is the future you see today the future you envisioned back then? No. The future, the future I see today is by far greater than the future that we saw back then. I'll give you a classic example. There were 250,000 plus people at the March on Washington. About 25% of those people were, were white, assembled in the front of the Lincoln Memorial. If in, 19, if in the planning of the march in the summer of 1963, if we had a cell phone, if we had a laptop, if we had a Blackberry, if we had Twitter and Facebook and Google, you know how many people we've had at that march? Not less than a million. Not less than a million. The thing that we didn't foresee, and I certainly didn't foresee, I didn't see the confluence of the emerging communication technologies, the power of being able to communicate a message through multi-platforms that would, en that would enable you to affect how people think about things and thereby potentially being able to mobilize them to action. Didn't see that. The other thing we didn't see is that we didn't see that over a period of time the great uh, wealth disparity that would occur. The other thing that we didn't fully appreciate and see, we didn't think that the United States Supreme Court would hold fast to the interpretation of the Second Amendment that was debated in Constitution Hall in 1789. It was the, 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 the right to bear arms, as enshrined in the Constitution, did not contemplate automatic weapons and uses and, and this great proliferation of guns. So we didn't, we didn't see the proliferation of violence. And the other thing we didn't see was we didn't um, see that the United States would, for a whole combination of reasons, become awash in all sorts of addictive drugs. Um, and, uh, and this has influenced, first of all, it's drained our national resources. The war on drugs has been a total failure in terms of significantly and significantly reducing or eliminating drugs. That is not to say there hasn't been some improvement, but at what price? Uh, you have a neighboring uh, country that's a, almost a failed state. So we didn't see that. Um, and I would say the principal thing we didn't see 
was that the absence of uh, real opportunity uh, for all people of all races and genders to overcome what I call the poverty gap and the income disparity gap. Thank you. Dr. Jones, I am um, I'm humbled, honored, and inspired to have you here today. So on behalf of Google and even the people you can't see that VC'd in, uh, thank you so much for joining us Now, can us I today. say one final thing? You sure can. Okay. You know, uh, last, uh, on the, on the uh, Dr. King's birthday on January 15th, was earlier this year, I was very pleased when Stanford University uh, had a banner uh, across opening across Palm Drive uh, onto the campus that said, Stanford remembers Martin Luther King Jr. Now I am hopeful that in the next King holiday, that when I open up my laptop and I see Google or Facebook, I hope I see something on Google that says, Google remembers Martin Luther King Jr. or Facebook. I want to see every major company in Silicon Valley to do what Stanford University did in displaying this banner across the campus that said, Stanford remembers Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you.